Welcome to another episode of Coaching Through Uncertainty. I'm Brianna Hodges, National Faculty for Future Ready Schools, and with me is one of my favorite people in the world, always brings a smile to my face, and leaves me completely inspired um, with all of his wisdom and education, educational practices, but mostly for his energy and his just heart. So um, without further ado, I've got Victor Tam. Um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, where you are, who you serve, and just kind of give everybody else out there a little peek into the heart of Victor? <laughs> of course. I'm going to start by saying that I feel the same about you, Brianna. You know, you bring so much to the conversations and to life, and I've, I've learned so much from you. Um, for me, I, I'm a school principal here in San Francisco Unified School District. We're part of the public school system. I'm at a school called the Edwin and Anita Lee Newcomer School, and until... I think two years ago, we were called the Chinese Education Center. Last year, we celebrated our 50th anniversary. Our school is focused on newcomer students from China. So 51 years ago, there was a huge influx of Chinese students into the United States and into San Francisco. And most of them were from Hong Kong and China at that time. So the school, public school system back 51 years ago didn't really know how to work with these students. So they tried to start a couple of classrooms with just newcomer students. And then from there, 51 years later, we have a school that's dedicated to working with newcomer students just from China. And in San Francisco, we're really lucky because we have two schools like this. We have the Chinese Education Center or the Edwin and Anita Lee Newcomer School. And we have the Mission Education Center, which serves the students from, who have a Spanish background who are newcomers. And um, the reason why I am so privileged and honored to serve there as the principal is because I came as an immigrant myself and I, you know, I'm old <laughs> and I came through at a time where I lived in a, in a very black and white environment. And the joke that I always have is that Chinatown was wherever my family was because that's how few Chinese I, I saw in the streets. And, um, and I didn't have any of this kind of support growing up. So I grew up in a very... Um, conflicted way where there was half of me that wanted just to be American, white American, and there was half of me that hated being who I was that was Chinese. And um, it wasn't, it took me a long time to, to make sense of all that. And now I'm in a position where I get to serve families with, you know, they're, they're feeling the similar struggle and um, I'm positioned to, to come full circle back to support students where I needed it a long time ago. <laughs> I love that. There's so many things in this that, that I just want to unpack with you a little bit because I, I think, you know, growing up in a small town in Texas, um, we, we, uh, there's so many things that you said that really, really resonate with me. Um, number one, having the, uh, you know, not having a lot of cultural influence, uh, you know, diverse cultural influence um, that comes in and then how, you know, how that feels for the, the few that are in those situations, right? Um, but alongside that, I also, one of the things that stood out with me is um, we talk about English language learners and we talk about, we recognize that we have many immigrants, that we have lots of, of, of students that are coming to us um, at different ages, right, with different uh, backgrounds and, and, and all of these things. But oftentimes um, there's one person who is you know, quote unquote, the English language learner teacher or, uh, you know, and, and it, it takes me to an experience that I had where, um, you know, what our teachers were very uh, accustomed to working with 
uh, students of you know Hispanic heritage and and with Spanish as their their background. Um, but we had two students that had come to us from and they were brother and sister and um, no excuse me they were brothers um, young kids that were uh, kindergarten and I believe um, second grade and spoke Mandarin Chinese and no one in our school district you know had in, I mean there was there was there were. were there was no support at all for it. And, um, you know, I, I, they, I was reached out to that said, how, how can you help us? And I was like, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't speak Mandarin. I don't, you know, I, there's not an app that can teach you. I mean, it's, there's all of these things. And that just really sits with me of, you know, all of these conversations and the, and, and, um, you know, then last year, my daughter was going into second grade. I, uh, I took her to, to class on the first day of school, um, walked her in, and there was this little girl, and she was just bawling, crying, standing in the middle of, of the, the hallways. And, um, and I stopped, and I, I reached out, and on her backpack, she had a note that was taped onto her backpack that said um, you know, what her name was and uh, what her... Um, and that had a phone number. I think that was, that was all that was on there. And, uh, and I remember like I reached down and I asked her and she didn't speak very much English, very, very, very little English, but she was just bawling, crying. And I reached out and I held her hand and I said, just, you just come with me and, and, you know, we'll, we'll help you. And so I just carried her around with me and I told my daughter, I walked with my daughter. We both walked with her and said, um, you know, I told my daughter, I've, I've got to go help her find somebody because, you know, now you're, you're, you're in your right place, but I need to go help her, um, get to, get to her right place. And, um, my heart just completely went out to be, um, in that situation where, where you are completely new. And so I think this is fantastic that you, are, are supporting that learning and that community in that way, um, you know, because there is so much of this school becomes the hub a lot in a lot of ways for um, for our new newly arrived um, communities. So yeah, I... yeah, totally. I think you know you you spoke about a few things. Um, one is that feeling of isolation as a minority. Like I. Um, I am a person of color, but growing up, I was literally a minority. I was the only Asian American in every one of my schools until senior year of high school. And in senior year of high school, there was an influx of Hmong refugees that came into our school. And, you know, it was interesting because at that time, I, I couldn't even identify as an Asian American with another Asian American. I was so conflicted. So there's that feeling of isolation. And how and, old were you, I'm sorry, Victor, to interrupt, how old were you when you, when you immigrated to the United States? So I came over when I was three months old, but I also grew up within a family that was we were so isolated. Like my parents still, their primary language is still Cantonese. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we didn't interact outside of our, our space, our, our apartment very much at all. Um, I had very little contact with other people and, until I went to school. And um, I always remember since Head Start, just, mm -hmm being pulled out by that one teacher, like what you're talking about, who, and being pulled out from the group and being different and just looking. And I have a lot of visual memories, but um, not a lot of audio memories, interestingly enough. Um, and, and just this continuous feeling of, of space, Distance, rather, more distance and isolation. Like there's this, um, at the core of who I am, there's a part of me that feels very, very disconnected at times. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think it stems from, from that isolation as a, a young child. Um, the other thing I wanted to touch upon is when you met that little girl who did not speak any English, 
but you connected with her. There are a lot of times we as educators, we have students that come to us where, where um, we may not know exactly what to do to work with this one student. The tools that we've learned along the way in our tool belts, they, they may not work with this one student. But I think that in my experience, as this is my 30, 30th year as an educator. Um, one of the things that I know and believe is that when you speak from the heart, people can hear from the heart. It's, it transcends language. And your experience with that little girl is, is testament to that, that here's this little girl. She didn't know what was going on. She was very isolated. She, you could tell that she felt um, very scared. And for you to come down to that little girl and, and connect with her from your heart, even though you had no language connection, no, um, like you didn't know her, she didn't know you, but she trusted you because she knew that you were coming from that place of your heart. Uh, and I think that so it's so important now more than ever when we are, you know, literally distanced from each and every one of our students, our families, our colleagues, that we need to tap into the power of the heart. And you know, there are um, there are people who are very natural at at tapping into that power mm -hmm. um, because it exudes from them. You know, they're the people like you, Brianna, who, who you just feel it and you just want to like, I just want to follow this person. <laughs> I don't care where they're going. I just want to follow them, you know? And, um, and then there, we have colleagues who have trouble with that for a lot of um, reasons along the way in life. People lose that power or get disconnected from it. And I think that um, I suspect that a lot of the, the tr um, challenges with distance learning can come down to this part. We know how important social emotional learning is and that social emotional connection. And districts are telling schools and, and teachers focus on social emotional, um, the social emotional person portion, those first week or first few weeks. But if you're not doing it every day, if it's not intertwined in who you are, in every lesson that you are, you are sharing, you're going to lose kids. You're going to lose a lot of your kids. You're going to lose it in this distance. And it may not appear in these first few days or weeks or maybe even months, but looking ahead, in this year, we don't know what it's going to be like. We don't know how long we're going to be in distance learning. And along this way, this, is, this may be a long year for all of us, or it could be a year where we, we find a way to connect through this machine yes. and meet heart to heart. Oh, I love that. I think, I think that part of it, and again, there's so much in there that I want to, I want to kind of talk through because I, and I love that you you really focus on SEL. And I, I would imagine that that is a huge component of, of your work in, um, you know, at the newcomer school because, you know, it's not what content you're teaching, right? It's, it's who, it's, it's, it's who you're teaching. It's that, it's that, um, it's that heart that comes into it and it's the connection. It's, it's not the content, it's the connection. And, um, you know, it's not speaking it louder. It's not, um, you know, there's not a, a magic trick to teaching um, immigrant students. It's, it's more of how can we connect and how can we, um, you know, really explain that information just like um, with any of our students, regardless of, of where they are from, um, every student brings circumstances and situations and suitcases to every, um, you know, interaction. And, uh, and, and so I love that, that you, know, you are 
for you, that was a big component of what was missing um, in your in your time growing up was that SEL moment um, that and not moment moments, not the right word, because like you said, it's intertwined into every single thing that we do, um, you know, as human beings, our brain truly wants to look at any kind of circumstance and figure out where we belong in that. And that doesn't mean that we're, you know, overly emotional creatures that just want people to love us. That's not what, what I'm trying to say. It's that we want to, we want to know where our puzzle piece fits. And, um, you know, we want to, we want to know that, uh, that, that there's a reason for us and there's a purpose for us to, um, to pay attention and to, uh, to feel safe or, or all of those pieces. And when we don't see that we connect in there, when we're, t when we're shown that we are different, right? Like I, I think you know, as, a, as a secondary teacher, I saw this all the time with my, um, my students who had different um, accommodations and modifications. And, um, you know, I had, I had several students that had modifications to have um, tests read aloud to them or, or, or things like that. And hands down, especially the older that they get, right, um, they don't raise their hand. They don't want the, and their, their scores, even if they were removed from the class um, and sent, you know, to have a small group um, test, they would their scores were, were, were tanking. And um, I would have the, uh, the, the other teachers who were pulling them out tell me they're not using them. There are all these different things. And so finally I, I pulled um, this one set of, of kids aside and I was like, tell me what's going on because you guys do this when you're in here with me. And they were like, we just don't, we don't, we don't like that, you know, we don't like being pulled out. I mean, they're adolescents. They don't want everyone to, to know you're different, right? And so, um, so that honestly was for me the the start of utilizing technology in my classroom. And I didn't have, I didn't have. We were not a one to one school. Um, we this was early, early on when none of this happened. But um, I managed to get a grant to have a classroom set. I got to have fifteen. It wasn't even a classroom set because I had thirty plus. <laughs> I had fifteen iPads, and I. Um, you know, started to, 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 I read aloud the test, right? And I just read it aloud, made it a little audio file and um, slapped it on the iPad and they, you know, played it. And I gave them a little pep talk at the very beginning of saying, you know, this is, you know how to do this. I believe in you, uh, you know, just, this is your chance. Now you get to fast forward me, you get to rewind me, you get to do whatever you want to do, but just, you know, use what you need to use. And hands down, every one of them, all of a sudden, they, their scores just went through the roof because they were no longer bringing attention to themselves for being different. And they saw that, and, and other people saw that they had a place within the classroom, not removed from it, but, but really in there. And I think that power, like you're, you're, you just, you told us, like that power of, of not being held differently is so important um, for our kids. And, and I, I just, I can't stress that enough of like that, what that looks like for them. The other thing that I really wanted to talk about with you was um, you talking about that isolation that uh, was coming from, you know, your, even, you know, your, your family um, as the, you know, what did you say? Chinatown is wherever we lived, right? Like, because you didn't have a community. Your family was your community, and um, and and we see this a lot with uh, you know with with um, a lot of of, of immigrants or newly immigrants or or you know where that um, that that uh, that native language is spoken at home, right? And so um, they're the only time that they're hearing English is when they come to school and and um, and all of those different pieces. And so I um, I'm just I'm curious about how, especially in your in your um, situation where you're the the principal of a newcomer school, you've got a community there, you know, there's a, a fairly established community, 50 years, obviously, at least of, of, um, of a, a strong Chinese presence and, and, and Asian American presence that's, that's in there. Um, how is reaching out to your community um, different or, or is it not um, as, a, as a principal? You know, how are you engaging um, with a, 
a, a very strong and proud community um, to help them feel as a welcome and part of a new community, I guess, as, at your new school? Uh, those are great questions. I think um, oftentimes we look at San Francisco as having a, a very significant Asian American and Chinese American uh, population. What we see with newcomers is that, and this is, a, this is fascinating, it's not just with the Asian American community, it happens with um, the Spanish speaking community and other communities too, that when you have a group of Asian Americans, um, Asian Americans by that I mean people who are either born and raised here who are Asian of Asian descent or people who have been here for many years as, um, as uh, who came as um, immigrants, but then like, you know, have been in the system here and are very familiar with the structures and the systems here. Oftentimes what we see is there is a disconnect between a newcomer and this, even this Asian American community. And when I was, when I served as a principal in one of our um, more traditionally regular schools, it was fascinating to see that there's this whole Chinese American community. And then here comes one or two Chinese speaking newcomers and the students didn't seem to accept them. Some even pushed them away and um, they felt very isolated. So there was this one student uh, at one of my former schools. Um, she came in as a fifth grader, as a newcomer. And she and I connected because I was a, a fairly new principal at that school. And she found out very quickly that I spoke Cantonese. So during lunch, we would just talk and chat. About halfway through the year, she stopped talking. She shut down and having SSTs in, and later on IEPs, um, we found out that she was, um, uh, she became a selective mute. Um, and um, the suspicion was that it was because she just didn't connect. And I think, um, as educators, one of the, the most important things that we have to do is teach kids how to be a community, how to be a good person and connect with people who are different from us. And I think that had educators across the United States done a better and more intentional job of this for years, we probably wouldn't be, have to address some of the racial injustices that we are facing right now. I do think that part of the thing, part of the breakdowns in our society are because of um, gaps within our educational system that we as educators have not done a good job in addressing intentionally and systemically across the board. Um, for us in our community, interestingly enough, our school is located right in Chinatown, San Francisco's Chinatown. And our families often report that they face a lot of um, prejudice when they go to Chinatown. <laughs> you know, um, Chinatown is changing. It's, Chinatown is changing in the sense that San Francisco Chinatown is, is deeply rooted in Cantonese, Canton, Southern Canton, and more and more of the immigrants coming, actually all of the immigrants coming are Mandarin because China switched over to Mandarin as, a, as an official language years and years ago. So every one of our students come in schooled in Mandarin and 
they come into San Francisco and sometimes even for them to go within the community to go buy groceries, they feel, they feel that sense of distance and isolation. Um, and I feel very positioned having lived through that to, to talk to them about it because yeah, a large, um, a big part of that reason is because I lived through that and I've come full circle and I can connect with people within our uh, San Francisco Chinatown community and with these immigrant families and talk to them about, you know, some strategies that they can try and use. Like, you know how it is. We can't control other people and how they are, but we can control who we are and how we respond. And these days more than ever, more than ever, we have to, we have to be very careful in how we respond. Um, so our school is an interesting place and I, I love this. You know, I, 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 I feel so fortunate to be able to hold these kinds of conversations with our families. And then on another level, our district is very progressive and pro, um, proactive in, this, in addressing equity and social justice. I'm really proud to be part of San Francisco Unified, um, especially in this way. Our superintendent who shared his own personal story recently with our admin team, um, he, he was outstanding in sharing his experience as a, as a black American growing up and as an educator. Um, and he's tasked us as principals to, to hold these conversations with our teams and our families. And I think that it's so important for us, for me, to hold these conversations with our families because they come from China and so much of what they see about America is through social media and news, right? And social media and news magnify the worst parts of us. <laughs> um, they come in thinking everyone in the United States owns guns, that black people are bad, that there's crime everywhere and you just have to be scared, you know? And we have to have these conversations with them to help them understand that there's, there's a lot of untruths in what they've seen and heard and learned their whole lives. Um, it's fascinating too, because some of our, our own students, our newcomer students who have gone on through other schools and into middle school and high school, they'll come back and visit because we're like a home to them. And I tell them, we're a family. Just like a family, you can go far, you can even lose touch, but you can always come back. Oh. And it, it's when they come back, like sometimes I ask them like, what are some of the challenges that you faced as a student? And um, I've, I've asked them about prejudice and they say, you know, the people who are harshest to us as newcomers are often Chinese Americans. And I asked, okay, then who, who are the people who are the kindest to you? And so often they say, it's the black kids and the Latino kids who really reach out and they, they make friends with us. And I think that's so powerful. You know, um, kids, I, yeah. No, 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 I, I, well, I love because I think one of the things that we say so much, but we rarely, we say, we rarely do, and especially as educators, is that we say we want to celebrate the unique gifts that everyone has, but then because of our systems and because of our, you know, our grades and our assessments and all of that, what we really mean is that we want you to fit into these, you know, these, these very specific um, commonalities that we've, we've kind of um, created. And I, I love that, that, that um, you know, you're showing that these kids are celebrating the diversity of, of each other. They're, they're recognizing 
you know, by saying that, that the black American kids, the, the Latinos are the ones who are, I would, I would venture a guess that they're not reaching out to, um, to, to these newcomer students as, um, oh, you're the same as me. Instead, they, they recognize that they too have been isolated as different and they're able to recognize that unique and you know that 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 um, the unique uniqueness and celebrate that um, beautiful opportunity that's that's there to connect with kids. And I think that is that's what you're that, that's what we want, right? We don't want to deny who you are. We want to we want to embrace and celebrate who you are. And and that is an element that we all need to to do a better job of um, entirely. Definitely. And I'm, I think my story also illustrates earlier within our educational system. Why is it that those Asian American kids show the most um, animosity towards these kids? I think a lot of times, just like before when you were talking about how we all want to blend in, like, you know, we go through these stages in life. And I remember as a teenager, I just wanted to be part of the whole. I never wanted to be the one. I think with Asian American and Chinese American kids, we grow up in this two very conflicted worlds. And um, even now within, within, even within San Francisco where the majority of our students are, are Asian American, we want, a lot of our kids just want to be white the yeah. relation into the into that environment right like we just want to be americans like that's what we want to be we want to we want to be white we want to be that that social media picture that that they've seen right and until we educate our um our students who are cross-cultural into seeing the system and understanding the system but also understanding who they are and embracing who they are, it's hard for them to care for another. And when that other represents a part of themselves that they actually want to escape, they will show, they will push. So for me, I didn't start to understand or accept myself until I was in my third year of college it took me that long and it was because i took my first asian american studies class and my world just blew up it was like i am not alone and this is how so many people have felt throughout their lives and there it's common and there's a part of me that that makes sense that that is worth loving and understanding. And it really wasn't until my third year college where I started to become a whole person. Um, and one thing that San Francisco did um, a few years ago was decide that ethnic studies should be taught in every school at the high school level. And I wish we could actually even, you know, start building that into the middle school and elementary school levels. Because had I been exposed to that kind of curriculum and teaching early in life, I, I can only imagine how, my, how different I would be. Yeah. No? Yeah. Yeah. I, so, uh, so many, so many things. And I know that you and I can talk for hours at length on all of this stuff. And I definitely, I can promise you, we are going to keep having these conversations. But um, one thing that I do, like just in, in interest of time and knowing that, that we've got a little bit to, to um, go through on this, I do wanna ask for you to, um, to give us a little bit of insight in this because, because one of the things that you're, you're really hitting on right now is definitely um, something that, that people are, are struggling with, they're kind of, you know, wrestling with right now, which is, um, you know, having this culturally responsive and culturally representative um, curriculum out there. And how do we do a better job of representing um, multiple cultures and diverse views out there? I know as um, I was a part of a, a, uh, of a study um, 
a lot of us came together, all different industries, all different um, ethnicities and, and races and genders. And one of the questions that was asked was, when were you first aware of your color? And, um, and so that kind of got me thinking through a lot of pieces. And then also, what, when were you aware of your gender, right? And um, uh, I, I certainly um, talk a lot about that in leadership and, and things about around there. But, um, you know, as a, as a woman, we don't have a lot of, uh, of representatives in our, in our curriculum of, um, of women in, in leadership. And um, that's even more marked um, around, around our people of color. People of color are very, very limited in how they are represented um, in leadership. And, and most of the time, it's around very specific months, right? Like February, we're going to talk about Black History Month, and that's it. We're going to, you know, hit the highlights and then, then never again. So we know and we recognize that we want to do a better job of that. Um, can you share something with us? And I know you can't fix this all in one moment, um, but can you share a, a thought or a strategy around how to improve um, cultural representation in the curriculum, um, even if it's a baby step at a time, but you know, to help um, us better allow for connections um, to our content area and, and help our kiddos feel proud of who they are and, and know that they have a way to, to see themselves in the future um, you know, through, their, through their learning. So got anything for us there? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, what you talked about in terms of baby steps is very important when it comes to deep shifts in who we are, whether it's in education or us individually or in our students. Like uh, an example is like, um, you know, we have these, these big um, directives oftentimes in school districts and people comply, but it, it only goes so deep and they'll do, they'll go through the motions of it, but it doesn't go deep. When we're talking about racial equity and social justice, and we want this to be deep, we want it to be life-changing. I think if we just force it as a compliance item, which we can easily do and go through these steps, it's gonna just touch the surface. But if we can tap into like we started earlier um, when we talked about the power of people's stories, you, you framed it really well that um, equity doesn't happen until there is empathy and empathy won't happen till we have our stories. I think, am I right? And I love that, you know, that was you. And I think that if we can start with people's stories, like you mentioned the school with two Mandarin speaking kids. And if there's a way for them to, to hear their stories and share their stories, like value the people and who they are and what they bring. And, and if we can do it honestly and openly, even within our faculties, right? Um, I've gone through so many meetings in my 30 years <laughs> where it's business, 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 surface, 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 blah, blah, blah. But when we can go deep, when we take, have that time and give people that space, and if there's that culture of trust and acceptance where people can be who they are and share their story and share their their um, strengths and their weaknesses, where it's very, very open. That's where it starts, I think. I think when we start to see, like part of it is that we can't see, we're the fish in the water. We can't see the water because of the, where we're coming from. But when we start sharing our stories together, we start to see the overlaps and the distances. And that's, those are the places where the tension happens. And that tension is the opportunity for growth. And I think it can happen 
for us as, fa as faculty teams, and it can happen within our circles of students. I love that. I love that. I think that, you know, part of it too is, is turning some of that over and not being the ultimate, um, like you said, those, the, the, the handing down the, the directive, right? Like we oftentimes see that, you know, in administration, we also see that as, um, as the teacher, right? Like, you know, here's the information that you will have, um, even if it's, you know, if you have in that situation where there's this two little Mandarin kids um, that are coming in, even if you as a teacher don't have information around that culture, you know, maybe share an, a story of your culture and then invite them to share a story of their own, you know, and I, I think that um, that's not putting the, the responsibility on that person. Instead, it's inviting them in to share and honoring their opportunity and their contribution. Um, and then we learn from it, right? Because I think that, that as adults, sometimes we feel if we don't have the answer, then we don't, you know, we don't know how to do it. That doesn't mean that we hide our head and we say we don't have a conversation. It means we need to, to be vulnerable and say, you know what, we're not doing a good job of this. How do I get that information? And, um, and, and I love that. You know, I, one of the, the beautiful things that I have seen happen um, in 2020, like let's celebrate a couple of the good things that have come from 2020, has been um, people, especially educators, coming together and acknowledging that we do need to do a better job of continually intertwining um, culture and race and um, representation uh, of all you know orientations everything into our our con our conversations and that starts with um, stories and picture books and you know representations in our curriculum and not limiting that to those very specific you know situations um and and i've seen so many social media conversations and you know been a part of so many um you know webinars and, and things like that where people are sharing hey this is a great one here's something that i needed over here and and really bringing those things to light instead of sticking our heads in the sand and saying oh no 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 this is the only way that it can be taught you know looking at it from great, I've always used this. I, I, there was a, an amazing social media post that was like, I've always taught To Kill a Mockingbird, which is one of my favorite novels. I loved teaching it. Um, that said, they were like, I've always taught this. What is a similar type novel that um, is written from a, from, from a Black American's perspective or from, you know, and, and so then that way, we're expanding that perspective. And, um, you know, I think that that has been a huge eye opener for me. And, and I love that that's, you know, that's what I'm taking a lot of from your, your baby steps in there is start with, with something, even if it's a picture book, even if it's, uh, you know, a, a, um, a phone call to home or whatever that looks like in order to, to help them feel that they are at home when they're in your classroom. Oh, yeah. yeah, and for us, when we pick and choose those stories, it's so important for us. Like, there's one of the awakenings for me is how how interesting um, white culture has influenced the stories. So, To Kill a Mockingbird, still like the problematic part of it is that it has this white savior right. kind of thing Absolutely. and um you know the other day my daughter was sharing a a um a podcast with me and the person was saying how isn't it amazing that tar this guy tarzan he could speak to the animals and he was so powerful he could um uh, he could fight all these native africans <laughs> and there's this white guy in africa <laughs> who just came here and he was able to do all these things, but these Africans who were born and raised in generations were seen as weak. And that's where like um, a movie like Black Panther was, wow, right? All of a sudden, here, is a, here are these Africans whose science is so advanced and they're, they're so powerful and they have, um, 
they bring so much richness into the world from who they are and from generations, you know? Like, yeah, that perspective, it's something that we have to be so aware of when we're choosing the stories for our kids. Especially because it, it can reinforce beliefs that were, aren't there. I mean, I know for, for me, I, I always chose a, a Shakespeare to, to teach every year. And um, one year I, I taught The Tempest and it was so funny because it was after, you know, it was the end. It was our, our final that we were working in in the year. And so my kids had, you know, they, we'd really worked through a lot of analysis and a lot of conversations around. We did a lot of studies on civil rights and, and kind of intertwined that throughout. So when we got to the Tempest, um, we talked a lot about what you were sharing about how, um, you know, all of a sudden here comes this white guy who, you know, comes in, you know, European guy who comes into an island, declares it as his own and takes on all of these pieces. And, um, and it was so funny because we were breaking it apart. One of, one of my kids was like, I'm so glad this did not happen here. Like this is, and I was like, okay, time out. Because we talked through how The Tempest was the final Shakespeare play. And it was very much influenced by, his take on colonialism and all these different elements. And, um, and I just had to, I mean, we had to completely time out, bring in US history, talk through colonialism, talk through slavery, talk through, you know, I was like Native American slavery, like all of this different piece. But um, I, I share that because so much of our conversations can reinforce a belief that's held um, if, we're, if we're not careful and, and looking at it through that different perspective. So. I'm gonna um, I'm gonna share that as as our final nugget to take um, to take with to take with us from this conversation. Definitely won't be our final conversation by any stretch of the imagination. But but for today's um, conversation, you know, look at that different perspective. Understand that everybody has something to offer um, wherever they are in their life and 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 whoever they are. Um, they've got a story to share. They've got a, a an opportunity for us to look at something differently and help them be involved in this this world we 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 love um we we love to be you know with our students we and and we have so much to um to to offer them and they have so much to offer us and so thank you for for offering a, a little bit of your heart to us and, and sharing your stories with us um i know i enjoyed every second of it. Um, I hope you guys have taken something from, from the playbook of Victor. And uh, I know I have, I'm writing furiously all kinds of notes down here and I'm making sure that I, I bring them into my practice every day. Thank you so much for um, joining us. And thanks to all of you out there who are coaching through uncertainty and, and you know, just find, find the certainty that is in the, the hearts and souls of our students. And um, thank you, Victor, for that very, very poignant reminder. So we'll see you guys soon. And thank you very much, Victor. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Brianna. Coaching Through Uncertainty is a Future Ready Schools podcast series that explores the new shifts in teaching and learning that are happening right now. Future Ready instructional leaders, coaches, and teachers are navigating challenges that were theoretical, optional, or barely feasible only last year, but have now become full-blown, full-speed, in-the-moment realities. Coaching Through Uncertainty is hosted by me, Brianna Hodges, National Faculty for Future Ready Schools. In each episode, we'll connect with Future Ready coaches on a mission to inspire, engage, and amplify innovative professional practice. We'll hear from the nation's top instructional leaders as they share their experience, expertise, and advice to reimagine teaching and learning to better suit today's learners with tomorrow's tools. You can subscribe and listen to Coaching Through Uncertainty wherever you get your podcasts. Go ahead and subscribe so you don't miss an episode. Coaching Through Uncertainty and Future Ready Schools are projects of the Alliance for Excellent Education. Together we're better. Together we're future ready.